I want you to just take a moment and look to your left and look to your right. You're looking at First Baptist family. You realize that? There might be a few, there's a few people missing. Anna, Manuela, a few other people I've noticed are not here. But for the most part, what you're seeing here is First Baptist Hobbs, New Mexico. It's great to see everybody. You know, it's a good family. It's a good family. Um, I want to tell you a story. Pardon me, uh, this story is going to play into the sermon. But let me tell you this story. Uh, it comes out of Nancy and I's life several years ago. Uh, many, many years ago, we moved to Prosper, Texas. Uh, we, we were looking in the Dallas area. I had to move there because of a job uh, move and all of that. And we decided we wanted to live in this little town called Prosper, Texas. We just thought, what a cool place to live, to live in a town named Prosper. So we moved out there, and there was 1,200 people when we moved there. Um, kindergarten through 12th grade was in the same building. It was a small, small rural community north of Dallas. It was a cotton farming community and had been that way for 100 years. And we just moved out there and we began to raise our children. And, and the community and the city of Dallas caught up with us. And the city grew significantly while we were there. When we finally left there, there was about 15,000 people there. I think there's about 25,000 people there now. So from, from, in about 19 years, it grew about you know, 20,000 20, or so people. I mean, it just exploded. But one of the things that never caught up with the growth of Prosper, Texas, for a long, long time was the football team. <laughs> the football team was terrible. It was awful, right? And we're, we're talking about Advent. We're talking about the Christmas season. We're talking about Christ. So, but you know, December is football season too. So I'm going to tell you a football story. So in, for 25 years, imagine this, for 25 years, uh, Prosper had played the town just to the north of it called the Salina Bobcats. Anybody ever heard of Salina, Texas? If you know anything about Texas football, you know that Salina, Texas was the place to be. It was a 2A school. Prosper was still a 2A school. And Salina, every year, beat the dog out of us. They just beat us. Just no mercy. Sometimes the games were 85 to nothing. I mean, it was horrible. They had beaten us consecutively, consecutively for 25 years. I mean, every year we would show up and we would just get the dog beat out of us, just, just get pounded. Well, in 2008, uh, not the Immaculate Conception, but a miracle happened. <laughs> a miracle happened. We showed up and we beat Salina 33 to 7. And the other side of that stadium was absolutely silent. They were shocked. They were in shock. We had beaten them. And when the final seconds of the game ticked down, the whole stadium, probably about 3,000 people at that time, rushed the field. And they celebrated. I'm surprised they didn't burn the town down. Um, but it was just the most amazing thing. It was so much fun to be a part of something so exciting. We had waited so long. I mean, they just ground, you know, they just every year, they just ground us in the dirt. We were just like fertilizer, man. They just grind us into the dirt. But then we stepped up and we beat them. And the excitement that went with that was just incredible. Now that plays in to the sermon this morning because we're going to look at the announcement, the pronouncement of Jesus' birth by the angels. And what I want you to capture is the fever, the excitement of what they had, what they had going on and how exciting it was um, to be there and to be a part. Can you imagine what it was like to be there and, and be on that football team for the first time in 25 years to have beaten the Salina Bobcats? You were a prosper eagle and you had waited for that moment a long, long time. Well, 
Jesus' story is much greater than that. Let me go back. Let me go back briefly and just discuss. I want to catch you up with where we've been. So we talked about God's promise, how God long ago, mankind sinned in the garden, and God made a promise that he would send a Savior, someone who really would suffer on our behalf. Uh, he, he indicated that, the, that the, the serpent, Satan, would bruise him on his heel, but that he would destroy the serpent's head. He would crush the serpent's head. God gave us this promise long ago that he would send a Savior to save mankind, to deliver us from sin. And then what we saw is for centuries what happened over and over again, God would give us predictive promises, prophecies that would tell us who this person would be and where he would come from and what he would do on our behalf. So God had a promise and God had a plan. And part of that plan involved suffering. The the children of Israel, they went from slavery out of Egypt into the wilderness and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. But during that time, to initiate their freedom from slavery, God gave them the, the ordinance of Passover. And the Passover lamb was slaughtered and the blood was put across the, 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 the doors of the, the doorposts. And the death angel came and he passed over the Israelites because the blood saved them from the wrath of God. And then we learned later, God created this elaborate sacrificial system that ultimately was put into the temple that was built in Jerusalem eventually. And on a regular basis, they would sacrifice animals. And God said that that sacrificial lamb would appease his anger against sin. You see, man was separated from God. God and man were in the garden, man sinned, and at that moment in time, for the rest of human history, mankind was separated from God. God is holy. Mankind is sinful. God is a loving God, but he is also a just God. And he says that I must punish sin. I must punish sin. And because of that, God implemented this sacrificial system. And this sacrificial system was an appeasement to his anger. God, when he would look down at mankind and and the children of Israel, he would see sinful people. But because there was a sacrifice made for them, his anger was temporarily appeased. And then we saw last week what God did through Jesus. God's plan has always been before the world ever ever began that he would send his son to die for you and me. It says that the just died for the unjust. God being a just God looked at Jesus And he took all of our sin and he put it on Jesus, the just one, the righteous one, the perfect one. He put all of our sin on him and he punished him for our sin. The just died for the unjust. And then what God did is he took Jesus' righteousness and he put it upon us. The scripture tells us that he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God. And so a just God justly punished sin and was fully satisfied, not just appeased, but fully satisfied by Jesus' sacrifice for our sin. His anger was fully and completely and finally diminished, done away with, completely removed because Jesus took it all. He took all our pain, all our suffering, all our punishment And then in exchange, he did something incredible. He gave us his righteousness. God is both the just, God is both just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. Romans 3.25. So God promised he would send a Savior. He sent a Savior, ultimately, who died for us. And he, through that sacrifice, secured our salvation. And this morning, I want to look at the excitement of what it must have been like. I want to go back and look at the true historical account of how Jesus came as a baby. God's pronouncement. You've got to find another P. You know, I had God's promise and God's plan. Now I want to talk about his pronouncement. Let's look. Luke. Turn, turn with me to Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. And you know, I just want to say this. 
You may have heard the Christmas story a hundred times. You may know it from backwards to forwards, but it never maybe has made sense to you this morning. Or it's never made sense to you before. I'm just going to pray. I just want to stop and pray that God will will open your heart and your mind to, to better understand what he has done for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the exciting news that you sent your son Jesus for us. And I, I know that in a room this size, most of us know Christ. Probably, hopefully all of us know Christ as our Savior. But there's that possibility that there is somebody here this morning who has heard this message before, maybe several times, maybe many, many times, but it never made sense to them before. I pray that, that you would open their eyes and open their hearts to understand the meaning of the Christmas story, how you love them, how you gave your son for them, and that they can have eternal life through him. I pray your blessing on the remainder of this service in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Let's talk about, let's read through the scripture here, and just imagine what it must have been like to have heard this incredible news. Luke 2, beginning in verse 8. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them. Can you imagine an angelic being, an angel of the Lord, suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Just the glory of God, the power and the majesty and the beauty and the holiness. Can only imagine the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. Angels, if you go back in Scripture and you look at all of the accounts of angels, in Scripture, you will find that they are incredibly powerful beings. They, they are not the meek little babies with wings that you see floating around in images. That is, that's just marketing, okay? Angels, if angels, there are angels, believe it or not, Scripture points to the fact that there are angels present even now with us, watching as we worship. If they were to reveal themselves, if they were permitted to reveal themselves to us this morning, we would be overwhelmed with fear because they are so powerful and so mighty. They stood before them, the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For today in the city of David, <clears throat> there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly, now get this, and suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is well pleased. And when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Wow. You know, you think being uh, a, 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 a prosper eagle and beating the Salina Bobcats after 25 long years is good news. That's nothing compared to what God has just announced to us the fulfillment of everything that God has ever intended to do is right now, right happening before these very, uh, the very eyes of these lowly shepherds. God's announcement. It's incredible. Just imagine the excitement they must have felt, what it must have been, how maybe confusing, um, maybe a little bit shocking, but the message is just full of excitement. The angel suddenly appeared. I mean, imagine if you were going to work one night and you were working on the night shift or something, and suddenly an angel just suddenly appeared before you. Can you imagine? Wow. I mean, that's not your everyday kind of thing. That is not something that just happens every day. And the beauty of this thing is that it is the, the message that mankind has waited for forever. I mean, literally, it is the message of the ages. How exciting. And, and imagine being a shepherd and being the one who is the first to receive that news. Wow. 
That's amazing. Amazing stuff. God had waited probably over 4,000 years from Adam to Jesus' birth to finally bring about what he had done for mankind. He, you know, and, and what I love about this, it's kind of like the, the football illustration. It's like, guess what? Our team wins. We're going to put one in the win column, right? Because Jesus now has come. His, his, his announcement, the announcement of his birth is here. We need to go check this out. Go see what God has done, what he has made known to us. It is good news. It is full of great joy. I mean, this is the message of the ages has finally happened. Imagine waiting 4,000 or more years for something like this to happen, and it finally has happened. When I think about good news, I think about, uh, you know, let's say you're a student, and you, you know, maybe you made an A on an exam. Maybe, you know, you did really well on an exam. Maybe an exam that you weren't thinking you were going to do all that well on. Maybe you made really good grades this semester or something. That's good news. How about this? If you're a student, you graduated. You reached a point where you finally finished all of your requirements and you graduated. Here's other good news. This is just kind of common stuff that we think of as common good news in life. I'm getting married. I'm getting married. You know, as a matter of fact, we have a young couple this morning. You're going to get married this afternoon. David and Jay. Um, I'm so excited for you guys. They've been waiting a long time for that. Jay just recently graduated. Uh, last No, yesterday. Yesterday. Congratulations. And um, so they are, we're going to have a, a wedding ceremony this afternoon. We're really excited about that. That's good news. That's fantastic news. How about this? We've got a few of these around here. We're having a baby. You know, that's always good news. That's great news, right? Got some, some, some women here who are having children. Um, how about this one? Maybe you bought your first house. You remember the excitement you had maybe when you bought your first home? You know, what? How, that's great news. That's fun stuff. How about this one? I love this one. Uh, if, for those of you, Jim Fry knows this one, you know, the, the personal, uh, what is it called? The Financial Peace University with Dave Ramsey. They have a big deal where you're suddenly debt-free. Oh, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be awesome to be debt-free? Oh, my gosh. And then there, of course, is um, health news. You know what? I got a good report from the doctor. No cancer. I love these. What about this one? I'm getting a raise. Everybody likes to hear that. I love that. I'm getting a raise. I'm getting a promotion. My boss just moved away. I love that one. But it's good news. It's good, good news. It is the announcement that mankind has been waiting for forever. We have a Savior. He's called the Savior, the one who would deliver us from sin and from wrath. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one who is full of all kinds of wisdom. He is the, 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 the perfect one who will reign and rule not just over Israel, but over the whole earth one day. And he is God. He is called in this passage, not just a man, but God. He is the Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The word Lord there means Yahweh, God. He is God. He brings atonement for our sin. He brings peace between us and God. He brings re redemption. He redeems us from the sin and the condition that we are in and delivers us out of sin and puts us into a place being in Christ. He reconciles us to God. There is no better news. There is no better news. And this news is for you. You see, the Advent season is very, very personal. If you understand part of the story, if you understand part of the meaning of Advent, you understand that this announcement, the announcement that was made by these angelic beings is for you. 
I want you to grasp how much God really loves you. That is what I am coming to learn more and more and more as I study the Scripture. One of the, uh, just pardon, uh, pardon me for just sharing this with you, but one of the things that, that is especially enjoyable about being a pastor is that you get to learn the Scripture because you have to study it. There, there are aspects about the gospel that you think you understand, but you, as you study it, you learn it more and more. And the depth of God's love, the meaning of Advent, the meaning of Jesus' birth, is a statement about how God loves you and me. And it is, it is for you. This message is for you. You have a Savior now. You have a Messiah. You have a God who is always with you. You have a great deliverer, someone who you can put all of your trust in. He is fully trustworthy. Whatever problem you're going through, whatever issue you're dealing with, he is there. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. This announcement is for you. Take that in. Use this time of year, this season to reflect on that, how much God loves you, how much he cares for you. He knows every hair on your head. He knows every issue you deal with, every fear you have, every joy, every excitement. He is that awesome. He is that great a God. The other thing that we need to realize is that this announcement is also for all people. You see those chairs back there? We have 225 chairs in this, in this auditorium right now and about 120 people sitting here. There's still a lot more places that need to be filled. There's a lot more chairs back there that need to be filled. There are a lot of people in Hobbs, New Mexico that need to know there is a Savior that loves them. We need to be like those angels. We need to be like those lowly angels that receive that message and get excited about it and take it to our friends and neighbors. You see, part of the message of Luke, the book of Luke, and, and the reason he gave this account of the shepherds receiving the news is because the shepherds were very lowly in society. They were looked down upon. They were, they were just agrarian people who took care of the sacrificial animals that we needed for the temple. No big deal, no great job, no special place in society. They were smelly shepherds. And yet God revealed the greatest news of all, kind, of all time to them. You see, there is no one so low that God himself will not reach down and love them. We've got people in our society around us, in Hobbs, New Mexico, who probably don't think very much of themselves, whose society does not think very much of them. We need to love them, and just like those lowly shepherds, this message is for them. Jesus is a friend of sinners. Jesus is a friend of those who are, who are really low in our society, and there's some of that here in Hobbs, New Mexico. We need to have a shepherd's response. Get excited about the message and go tell people about it. Just like the Prosper Eagles were excited about winning their game, and believe me, they talked about it for weeks, how they beat Salina, how they beat the Salina Bobcats for the first time in 25 years. We need to be like that about Christ. We do need to tell more people about Jesus. We need to announce it to the world. I was looking up some statistics. There are approximately 7.4 billion people in this world. 3.1 billion of those people are unreached, have never heard the gospel, never heard the true account of how Jesus came and was born in a manger and then ultimately died and rose again on their behalf. Did you know that only 10% of the missionaries who are deployed into the world today are trying to reach that 3.1 billion unreached people group, people groups. Imagine that. There are so many people who do not know Christ in the world today, but many of those same people live right here. 
They live right here in Hobbs. They need to hear the, the beautiful news that Jesus came for them. Let me read. Just I just want to read for you just a couple of, of the lyrics from some of the, the uh, Christmas songs that we sing. And I, I want you to think about your role in taking this message to your friend or your neighbor your relative, whoever it might be. Come to Bethlehem and see him whose birth the angels sing. Come adore on bended knee, Christ the Lord, the newborn king. You see, the angels announce that, and so we are called to do that as well. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Another one, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. And finally, here's one. Go tell it on the mountain. Over the hills and everywhere, even in Hobbs, New Mexico. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. This morning, be grateful that God sent his son for us. Be grateful that it was announced by angelic beings, but let you and I take the same story to the world. That Christ is born, our Savior, our Messiah, Yahweh God is born. He is born, and He can change their lives, just like He's changed yours. Let's pray.